We're just letting a few more people join the meeting and we'll start formally in about one minute's time. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming along to tonight's meeting. It's called What's Happening in Cuba, um, and it's a very timely meeting, of course, uh, following events of uh, recent weeks. My name is Rob Miller. I'm the director of the Cuba Solidarity Campaign here in the UK, and I'm going to be chairing uh, tonight's meeting. We've got a wonderful lineup of uh, speakers uh, from Cuba, uh, from Bolivia, and, of and from Britain. Um, and they will all be uh, talking and discussing uh, the recent events in Cuba and how the US government and the mainstream media have responded to those events. Before I start, I just want to go through the format of uh, this evening's meeting. Please use the Q&A box um, if you wish to post any comments or any questions for our panellists tonight. We do aim to finish the meeting by 7.45, but if there is time, uh, we will be able to take a few questions and ask the panellists to uh, respond to some of your points raised. As I said, tonight's meeting is res in response mainly to the events in Cuba, which took place around the 11th of July, a couple of weeks ago, uh, when, when there were protests in several towns and cities across the island, uh, in response mainly to the very difficult economic and health situation that the Cuban people are experiencing at the moment. Now, there has clearly been a uh, huge amount of misreporting about these events, uh, much of which ignores the role of US economic warfare, the blockade, uh, and US government funding of opposition groups inside Cuba and outside Cuba, mainly uh, in Florida. So this is an opportunity uh, to hear about what is happening and what we as friends of Cuba can do to make ourselves aware of the situation, to share that information widely and to campaign against US intervention and for an end to the US blockade at this difficult and dangerous time for the island. Now, our first speaker tonight is Cristina Escobar, who is a Cuban journalist. She's based in Havana and she has a regular radio show uh, in English on Radio Havana Cuba, as well as broadcasting on several other Cuban news channels, including Canal Caribe. And Christina also spent uh, a year studying broadcast journalism here in the UK at Westminster University on an achieving scholarship. And as many of you will know, unfortunately, Zoom is blockaded uh, uh, from being able to be, be of use in Cuba. So it's, it's, it's impacted by the blockade itself. So I managed to interview Christina on Friday. Uh, so we're going to play some of the highlights of that interview. It's about 30 minutes long in total. And we're gonna put the whole thing up on YouTube, but we're gonna play about 12 minutes of that interview now uh, to give you those first hand uh, reports from Cuba. Like I say, the link to the YouTube for the full interview will be available in the chat box. But first of all, we're gonna hear from Cristina Escobar in this video interview. On July 11th, uh, there are two big uh, scenarios that, although are related, can't be um, uh, can be explained simply. It's, it's not a simple situation. So it's it's a it's a fact that Cuba is under a combination of crises. Uh, we did have an economic crisis before the pandemic. The enforcement of, of Trump's measures, which affect not only tourism. Uh, but also affect the family economy because all the 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 ecosystem of uh, informal jobs of the driver that used to drive the American visitor around in a lot of cities on, of the island, uh, the Palatar, the restaurant that used to host the the American visitor, all of that disappeared from one day to the other because Trump decided. Uh, it's quite complicated, I won't get into that now, but basically cruise ships stopped coming to Havana from the US and uh, that service did, did bring a lot of Americans, visitors uh, and a lot of people benefit from jobs related with the cruise ships coming. Uh, so first of all, 
the Trump enforcement, and that uh, made the economic crisis even worse. Then the pandemic came along, and although Cuba was able to handle the pandemic much better than most of, of the countries of the world, now the situation is quite serious, it's quite complicated, and the transmission is out of control. And although we do have, and we're very proud to, to say that, we do have two vaccines uh, already being administered to the, to the population, the transmission is far uh, fa faster than, than the vaccination effect. So uh, the situation in hospitals, the shortage of medicines, um, a, a, a specific crisis around, uh, around electricity services, related with a technical problem, not with oil um, uh, supplies. And of course, the shortage of food and the fact that everyone is at home. A lot of jobs are stopped, are not are no longer happening. A lot of people out of school, a lot of disconnection from institutions, all of this and the pandemic, of course, the fact that you can go out, the fact that you can do anything and the fact and, the, and, and there's a background to this crisis related with uh, several neighborhoods and groups of people who are suffering more the inequalities uh, inherited to the fact that we are a third world country in which inequalities do happen and do exist and we are an impoverished country. So this is one scenario. There's definitely reasons to be upset, to be, uh, to be, to, to can't see hope in the future. There are reasons for that. And at the same time, there was a huge uh, campaign organized, obviously organized online from the US using different kinds of, of reference. First, uh, the hashtag SOS Cuba started with SOS Matanzas, which is one of the province's hardest hit by the pandemic. Uh, it was very masterly uh, used by influencers online, essentially on Twitter and Instagram. And a lot of these campaigns online, let's remind our audience that Cuba is every day more connected to internet, is every day more uh, cheaper to, to get online. Uh, so a lot of people went through that and there's tons of money being dedicated to what in the US they call programs of regime change, which are basically programs that violate the Cuban sovereignty and they're using the what we would we would call people underprivileged people people uh, impoverished uh, groups that these people are being used as weapon are being capitalized to be to to act against the government so to disconnect them from the revolution from social programs from their own society and um, they're being they're being told to in different ways paying money like, um, not, I'm not talking about thousands, I'm, I'm talking about very little money, uh, promising them some sort of leadership in a future political uh, change in Cuba. And these people were used, and these were, let's say, the sponsors, the pushers for these um, riots on July 11th. So both things are true. So there are reasons to be upset in Cuba, there are reasons to demonstrate in Cuba, is a reality, but at the same time, what happened so well articulated, suspiciously articulated on July 11th, it's clearly, uh, was clearly um, planned uh, strategically from abroad. And this is all the money that for years, the US government has put into these platforms, into a bunch of media who are uh, at service of Washington's interests on the island. And it was, uh, to be honest, uh, July 11th, I saw images and I saw events that I would never, uh, I, I, I never thought I would, I was going to see in my country. Uh, it was a sad day. And I definitely believe that requires a revision of how the government is communicating with, with the people in general and, and how the economy and decisions internally uh, and mistakes that we're making internally need to be addressed. And, and you, can't er you can't erase one thing with the other. It was manipulated by the US. We had this war for decades now, uh, but now it's getting to a whole new level. It's getting more violent and it's, it, it's giving the impression that it's all internal 
that is only related with internal problems and the failures of the government. And it's far more complicated than that. And it's also very, uh, very, I would say, coward to do this in a context of pandemic. And now we're seeing peaks in the in the levels of transmission is strictly related to demonstrations of July 11th. But obviously, an intervention on Cuba from the US doesn't have a humanitarian interest. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of people, uh, for example, the uh, crazy major of Miami calling for war intervention, for bombs, for violence in Cuba. So I, I just don't relate to this uh, humanitarian intervention narrative because all I see from that country is aggression and our ways of limiting the way in which me as an individual and my country can develop uh, normally as any other country of the world. So it's a lie. It's not true that they are caring or they're worried about the humanitarian situation in Cuba. This is a, a perfect excuse and a scenario uh, uh, as that doctrine of the raw fruit that finally we're getting ready and the revolution will be toppled like eventually now in just a few days and, and, and it's happening. And that's not true. Uh, as a matter of fact, Cuba is more ready and, and is more prepared to deal with crisis than with circumstances of peace or negotiation because for 60 years we've been under crisis and under an economic war. But what these, all of these people calling for intervention, humanitarian or any, or, or any sort, all of these people uh, although my, some of them might be confused and might be thinking about, well, finally, we will have a lot of medicines or a lot of food. I, I don't know what goes through their mind, but the reality is that this is a way of justifying either a military intervention or justifying uh, and the, the, the sanctions, justifying more pressure on Cuba uh, because the government is not even able to uh, to deal with the current situation, and this is this is this is a portrait. This is a landscape that they're trying to show, but it's it's not the reality. The media um, uh, construction of what's going on in Cuba is tremendously important because usually media is is uh, it, it has journalists. Most of, by the way, for example. Uh, BBC journalists are no longer in Cuba. They they have a, like a producer that come back and forth. They are they're in Mexico, and and, and obviously this impacts the way, uh, for example, BBC covers Cuba because if you're not here, uh, it's even harder for you to to understand what's going on. And then I always say that Western media, when people t tell me about. Um, the the unbiased media, the objective media, the free media. Uh, I always tell them that I just challenge that because um, I see myself that hardly ever uh, a big international outlet uh, of any sort, uh, web or TV or whatever, passes the test on Cuba. Hardly ever, because usually the perspective on Cuba is 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 misled is politicized and it fits with the agenda and the perception they have on Cuba uh, of, of those that work in that media, of the power that uh, pays for that media and not the reality and the complexity of this country. And this is another example. In crisis, you see that uh, more and more clearly. Uh, the perception has been this is a failed state. Uh, the situation is out of control. Uh, and everything is about the repression to demonstrators. And although it might have been uh, evidence of, of occasional uh, violence over, from a force, from a police force that is not used to this kind of situation, uh, in general, the violence has come more from these articulated demonstrations that in some parts of the island has become uh, quite violent, including launching 
stones to a, 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 a child hospitals in Matanzas. I'm talking about serious violence here, unadmissible uh, violence here. Uh, and, 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 and the perception of media is that um, the, the, the police is being repressive, that the state is calling for violence, and that the situation is absolutely out of control. This is a lie. This is not true. And this fits with Washington agenda and perspective from Cuba. Thank you for, for inviting me to this. But for me, I think the biggest uh, kind of help that we can receive right now is putting the word of, of how Cuba really is and what's traveling this country out there uh, with, with a sense of responsibility and with on understanding and challenging the Western media narrative on what, what are the problems in this country. Uh, there were episodes of violence against the UK embassy in London, uh, and we need to stop this, uh, this attempt of, of, of pushing us apart, of divorcing us apart, of polar polarizing this debate, and which in the end has the, the, the purpose of losing the side of what's the real problem, what's the real enemy here. And the real enemy is, is, a, is, is, is a country that has determined as the purpose of, 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 of as a clear and publicly uh, outspoken purpose of just erasing the political system of this country because it sets an example for the rest of the world. And they just don't want that. And as this country, and this is a perspective that it has been set in by many analysts, this country is moving forward and it's moving forward fast. Uh, we are about to expand the private sector control and tax in the private sector, but giving more jobs and better salaries. This country is definitely moving forward. And this is the moment in which they decide to do this because they don't want Biden to take the Obama's path. And because, uh, and because they think this is the moment to actually go turn Cuba in what they want to see, what it used to be in the 50s, uh, the backyard, backyard of the United States, a country with no sovereignty, a country with, uh, which could be a co absolutely colonized by the multinationals that run the international economy. That, that's what they want. And, 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 and we can't let them do that. And the first victim, and I didn't say this, the first victim in a war is truth. And that's why it's so important that you guys uh, keep doing what you do and, and keep putting the word of what this country means for the rest of the world out there. Well, thank you, uh, Christina. As I said, that was recorded on Friday. Uh, Zoom is blocked in Cuba. So uh, we were very pleased to record that interview on, on Jitsi on Friday. And uh, I'm sure you understand that, that Christina uh, is speaking to us from a very uh, unique position in, in, in Havana. As she says herself, it's so important that we inform ourselves and others about what is really going on uh, in Cuba. And Christina has regular shows on uh, radio Havana, Cuba, and links to those shows and uh, her full interview are in, in the chat right now. And while I'm on, on that, if you're not already uh, registered on our mailing lists for, for our Cuba updates, our regular email bulletins, then please do sign up for those uh, in chat so you can get regular updates about what is going on uh, in Cuba and about the activities over here in our campaigns against the blockade and so on. Right, our first speaker uh, from, from this panel, uh, people sitting here, is, is Graham Morris MP. Graham is uh, the Labour MP for Easington, and he's also chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Cuba. And Graham is gonna speak, I, I believe, about some of the uh, fabulous work that he and many of his parliamentary colleagues have been able to do in their, their uh, campaign to explain about uh, Britain and Cuba, friendship between our islands, and obviously about the blockade and the impacts of the blockade. Graham, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank, thanks ever so much, Rob, and um, uh, welcome to everybody and all the participants from all over the world. I want to bring solidarity and greetings from the uh, all party group in the UK Parliament um, to Cuba and all its friends. And just to say what a what a great honour it is for me to, to have the opportunity to share a platform uh, this evening and to hear 
firsthand from so many excellent journalists, from diplomats, uh, from trade union leaders, uh, and from politicians uh, about what's happening in Cuba and how we can support the Cuban people and seek to um, uh, lift the, uh, the embargo on the blockade. I, I just want to say a, a couple of words. I listened very intently to uh, our first speaker, to Christina Escobar. And I just want to say, first of all, it is important that we all understand, I'm certainly very aware of the difficulties that have been and are being experienced by the Cuban people currently and in recent months. And I'm very much aware that food, medicine and fuel shortages are critical and are causing real suffering to people on the island. But I think it's also important, uh, as Christina um, suggested, that we are aware and that we point out that the fundamental cause of these shortages is the cumulative effects of the ongoing and cruel US blockade. And yes, there are problems, additional problems that are being caused in Cuba and in many other countries by the pandemic. However, these have been exacerbated in Cuba by the impact of, of the blockade, the sustained impact, and by an additional 243 sanctions that were imposed by the Trump administration over the last four years, including 50 restrictions, which unbelievably were imposed during the COVID-19 pandemic itself. And in addition to this, in many countries across the globe, the current international health crisis has indeed stretched resources to the limit, and it's caused great distress and alarm in many populations. In Cuba's case, the effect on the economy has been devastating because the island relies so heavily on international tourism, and it's been so difficult, in fact impossible, uh, to access hard currency. Um, the, the US blockade and its impact on the Cuban economy is now more severe than at any time in the past 60 years, in the 60 year history of US sanctions against Cuba. And Rob asked me to say some words about what we in the UK Parliament have been doing, uh, along with other colleagues, um, to, uh, to raise the case and to seek um, support, solidarity and assistance for, for the Cuban people. And myself uh, and many other MPs, my colleague and good friend Richard Bergon is, uh, is, on the, is on the webinar this evening. We've been calling for urgent action to help the Cuban people now for, for many months. And uh, in February of this year, together with uh, 58 other colleagues, um, I, Richard included, I, I was able to uh, a table, a, a statement of intent, it's called a parliamentary early day motion 1550, which called for the British government to improve tra trade relations and, and for the Biden administration uh, to remove the island from this list, the, the list that the Americans have, the state sponsors of terrorism list, and to normalize relations in order to support the Cuban people uh, at, at this time. I should also point out that members of the European Parliament's friendship group with Cuba and indeed 80 Democratic um, congressmen or congresspeople called upon President Biden to live up to his um, pre-election uh, campaign promises by reversing even some of the Trump administration's measures which are causing such unnecessary harm and suffering to the Cuban people. And indeed, at a bare minimum, uh, the Biden administration could have reversed those Trump sanctions which prevent Cubans living abroad from helping family members back on the island. They're no longer allowed to uh, send home remittances. It could also have reopened the visa section of the US Embassy in Havana to allow family visits uh, to be processed more speedily. None of these things were done in the first six months of his presidency. 
despite a growing food crisis and shortages in Cuba, is a direct result of the policies uh, of Trump and of the US administration. So in May of this year, again, on behalf of our uh, all party group uh, for Cuba, I wrote directly to President Biden, calling for these changes to be made as a humanitarian gesture uh, during the current health pandemic. It, it, it seems to me US policy towards Cuba is driven far too much by the politics of confrontation and uh, of promoting the personal interests of individuals and politicians in Florida and elsewhere, when in reality, it would be better driven by compassion and cooperation. It's clear from everything that we've heard and read, sanctions harm the Cuban people most. And what they also do is they alienate the US within the international community. And that was shown by the most recent vote in the United Nations General Assembly in June of this year, when 184 countries voted for the blockade to end against just two countries who voted for it to continue. That was the United States and Israel. And our own experience in the United Kingdom is that cooperation and dialogue between the UK and Cuba has indeed opened the door to improved and more constructive relations which have been beneficial to both countries, especially during this current uh, global pandemic. Uh, and if I can give some examples, Robin, in, in April of 2020, uh, Cuba very kindly provided safe haven and safe docking uh, for a, a COVID-19 stricken British cruise ship, the MS Braemar. Uh, and in, in August of 2020, Cuban doctors provided medical support in the, effort in, in the effort against the virus in British overseas territories. And that was one of 55 Cuban medical brigades that have been working in over 40 countries in the fight against COVID-19. And, and, and I might say a, a number of us in the UK Parliament have actually nominated the Cuban, the International Medical Brigades for a, a Nobel uh, Award in view of their selfish, uh, selfless uh, sacrifice and, and tremendous example. Uh, for its own part, the UK has helped uh, and reciprocated the uh, kind gestures uh, fr from the Cuban people and the Cuban government by providing training and scholarships for Cuban uh, students studying in the United Kingdom. And th that cooperation itself uh, built upon a successful visit uh, of Prince Charles to Havana in 2019, uh, be before the pandemic. Uh, and Cuba is now looking to export vaccines uh, and other um, treatments, pharmaceutical treatments, which could benefit patients worldwide. And I, I might just as an update, um, uh, Rob, say that in response to my letter to uh, Joe Biden, to President Biden, I, I actually received a, re a reply from the Chargé d'Affaires uh, from the US Embassy in London. And he said US policy was being revised uh, unfortunately, recent actions uh, have only been to add more sanctions rather than remove existing sanctions. Uh, and what we've seen is um, US government uh, representatives, representatives of the US administration meeting with interest groups in the US who were calling for um, violent intervention and, and regime change on the island. I, I, I do welcome genuine efforts to support the Cuban people at this time. Uh, Cuba is open to receiving genuine humor, humanitarian aid um, and a number of countries have done so over the last um, two weeks. I also want to applaud the actions of the Cuba Solidarity ca Campaign, including their members and trade union affiliates, including my own Union Unite. And we're going to hear from our General Secretary shortly who have raised more than £80,000 
in order to purchase medicines and syringes to help treat COVID patients in Cuba and deliver the vaccination program on the island. So in conclusion, uh, Rob, what I would say, if the, if the US government and President Biden are serious about wanting to help the Cuban people at this time, then the best action it could take would be to reverse the Trump era sanctions and to end the blockade of the island with immediate effect. Okay. That's brilliant, Graham. That's uh, really, really clear. And uh, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, the All Party Group and your parliamentary colleagues for all the work you've done because it's been very focused and very clear in its approach uh, towards the US and what you can do uh, over here. So thank you very much. The letter exchange between yourself and uh, the United States uh, Biden uh, administration is uh, linked on our chat now. So people can see that full exchange, which is, is very interesting. It was also reported in our magazine, Cuba C, uh, which I've got a copy here for people. It's a great magazine. And while I'm at it, uh, can I make an appeal to any of you uh, watching tonight, if you're not members, of the Cuba Solidarity Campaign. You really should be. If uh, if you want to help Cuba, it's definitely the best way to uh, show your support for Cuba and learn about the situation, but also empower yourselves and learn about the information so that you can share with others uh, the best way to campaign against the blockade. And you receive the magazine, lots of uh, uh, bags and free gifts as well when you join. Um, and there's a link in the chat there as well. Um, and we do welcome everybody uh, to join the campaign. I'm really pleased that over 300 people are with us right now live uh, from across the globe. And we'll come back to some of those as we go through the meetings. I know there are people from all over the world. So everybody who's joined us now is extremely welcome um, in tonight's meeting. Thank you once again, Graham. I hope you'll stay to the end of the meeting to uh, pick up on a few questions. You mentioned our next speaker, uh, Len McCluskey, the General Secretary of Unite, the biggest trade union here in the UK. Uh, Unite issued a wonderful uh, statement uh, a couple of weeks ago, precisely on the situation in Cuba. Um, and that is the latest in a long line, a long proud tradition of solidarity and friendship between trade unionists here and their brothers and sisters uh, in, in Cuba. Um, Len is unfortunately unable to be with us in person tonight, but he did record uh, this message for you, which we'll play now. Hello, sisters and brothers. I'm sorry not to be able to join you in person this evening for such an important discussion about the events in Cuba. working with our sister trade unions across the world. You know, the bonds of solidarity and friendship between us and Cuban workers have included numerous exchanges from attending each other's conferences to voluntary work by our young members on work brigades and of course, the long fight for the freedom of our Miami Five. Over many years, in all our contacts and discussions with Cuban workers, their unions, and with the five and their families, we have witnessed the impact of the inhumane blockade and interventionist US policies on the people and the country. These policies have prevented the nation from developing to its full potential and hindered trade with other countries who wish to invest and work with the island. Let there be no doubt, UNITE fully acknowledges the essential grievances of Cuban workers and their families due to shortages of food, power and medicines. These became much more acute during the Trump presidency due to extra measures imposed by his administration and they have not been alleviated under President Biden. These, along with the COVID pandemic, are the root causes of the disturbances. Florida was held by Trump in last year's presidential election, and Biden, with an eye on a possible re-election campaign, has effectively thrown in his lot with the extreme right wing in Miami leading members of which, including the city's mayor, 
have even advocated airstrikes against Cuba. The United States has been running a blockade against Cuba for almost 60 years. And since 1990, the blockade has been condemned year after year as unlawful by the United Nations General Assembly. The hypocrisy of the US Congress angers me. They talk about the sanctity of the law, and yet they have ignored international law for decades. The US and its singular ally, Israel, are perpetually on the losing side in this vote that even the United Kingdom under Boris Johnson uh, supports. Such is the all-embracing nature of the blockade that last year a consignment quite disgracefully of COVID-19 medical aid, including pre PPE ventilators and testing equipment, was prevented from reaching the island. Despite developing its own vaccine, a shortage of syringes and other medical resources is hindering the speed of Cuba's mass vaccination rollout. The Cubans are already uh, possess the necessary infrastructure to ensure that materials and medicines get to where they are most needed. And the simplest measure President Biden could take to avert a crisis in Cuba would be to lift the blockade, which the United Nations estimated has cost the Cuban economy $130 billion. That's a staggering amount. Funding from the US for Cuban opposition groups since Trump assumed the presidency has amounted to $17 million. Talk of a humanitarian corridor is cover for US intervention from Guatemala in 1954 through to Chile in 1973 and elsewhere, more recently in Latin America, has never been beneficial for working people. The US government's insistence on this blockade amidst a global health crisis doesn't advance the rights and welfare of the Cuban people. It only causes more suffering and shortages. Unite is pleased to have contributed to the Cuba Solidarity Campaign Emergency COVID-19 Medical Appeal for Cuba to help provide medicines at this difficult time. And we are proud to have supported the campaign for the Cuban doctors who have volunteered around the world to help fight the pandemic and in other humanitarian emergencies over the last 15 years to receive the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. We stand with the Cuban unions, which have said what Cuba needs is for the blockade to be eliminated. Unite calls on the President of the United States, Joe Biden, to immediately and unconditionally lift the illegal blockade. My message to the President is show the world that you are different, different than Trump, and herald a new era of cooperation that will benefit the Cuban people. I send my best wishes to all my comrades in Cuba. Keep up the fight. And your British comrades, brothers and sisters, stand shoulder to shoulder with you. Well, once again, what, what a, a brilliant uh, explanation of uh, Unite's uh, position showing uh, a complete awareness and understanding of what international uh, solidarity is all about at this time. And I'd like to thank Len McCluskey uh, very much. I know he's standing down as General Secretary this year, but I'd like to thank Len. I'd like to thank his predecessor, Tony Woodley, and all the uh, executive and uh, the membership of Unite, but also all the trade unionists uh, across the UK. 23 national trade unions are affiliated uh, to the Cuba Solidarity Campaign, and they are a a backbone of uh, the solidarity movement in this country. And we're very, very grateful um, and proud of that association. So thank you, Len and Unite for that brilliant uh, uh, thing, uh, 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 message, and also for the statement that they put out, which again, I think is available 
on, on the chat right now. Now, Len mentioned in there the medical appeal that we've been running and uh, we've done two stages of appeal right through COVID. We've raised, well, it's well over 80,000. I think it's approaching 100,000 uh, pounds now. And we've recently uh, been able to buy uh, five very specific uh, shipments of medicines and medical equipment, including syringes um, and specialized equipment uh, for the vaccine program in, in Cuba, which has been sourced by the Cuban Ministry of Health. So they're very specific items that are necessary uh, for the rollout of the vaccine program. And we've been managed to buy those across the world from Germany, from Switzerland, from China. Uh, it's been tricky, uh, particularly in light of the blockade itself. And I won't go into too many details about how we've managed to move the money around, but it's been complicated. But I'm very uh, pleased to say that, uh, that those shipments have uh, gone over to Cuba now and are helping uh, Cuba at this time. And we will continue uh, to do that to help fill the gaps uh, in, in the Cuban uh, medical programs for, for everything they need at this moment. So a massive, massive thank you to Unite, but also to anyone here watching tonight who has donated already. And if you'd like to donate again or would like to donate for the first time, then of course the details are in the uh, chat box right now. Um, and you can uh, donate online uh, there to that uh, COVID-19 appeal. Thank you. Now, our next speaker, I'm really, really very pleased to welcome here uh, from Cochabamba, I think it is, in uh, Bolivia, uh, Oli Vargas, who is a journalist with Cachuan News. I'm, just, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, uh, which is a wonderful Bolivian news channel that reports on Bolivia, but also on the region in its entirety. It was created very much in 2019 at the height of the struggle against the US-backed coup uh, in Bolivia. Um, and it helps to give voice to uh, popular movements, social movements in, in Bolivia internationally. And Oli reported at that time on what was going on uh, in Bolivia and especially on the media manipulation uh, around the coup and the reporting of the coup and of course the foreign aggression and intervention in those that terrible uh, moment and I think tonight Oli is going to talk about not only about Bolivia but some of the comparisons I believe between what happened in 2019 in Bolivia when you saw those terrible pictures of the attacks on uh, you know mass supporters and Evo Morales and what's been happening uh, recently in Cuba. So we're very, very grateful you can join us uh, tonight, Oli. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thanks for, for inviting me to this event. I've, uh, I've always been a supporter of the Cuba Solidarity Campaign, you know, events. So it's, it's, uh, it's an honour to be, to be speaking here on the panel. And yeah, we, uh, when there was the protests in Cuba, um, you know, last month, you know, a co-founder here at Calcetra News, uh, Camila Escalante, someone who's lived and worked in Cuba. So we were able to have a number of contacts, collaborators who are sending us some material, and we were able to uh, just let the world know about the other side of what was going on in Cuba. Just, you know, posting, for example, videos of the mobilizations in favor of the revolution that were going on in, you know, on the ground in Cuba, not just in Havana, but in smaller towns, cities, provinces across the country and you know just posting these sometimes you know quite grainy videos you know, recorded by people with you know, their, their phone there on the ground when almost viral was thousands and thousands of shares because people no one else was doing it there wasn't anyone else giving a platform a voice to the millions of Cubans who support the revolution who identify with the revolution and it was that sort of thing that pushed us to set up Calcetra News in, in the first place, because one of the things that annoyed me the most about the coverage of the, you know, foreign media and international media about the coup in Bolivia was the way they used a lot of the narratives that have been used in Cuba. So the thing they said in 2019, when there were right-wing protests against Evo Morales by the middle and upper class sections in the big cities, you know, the BBC, uh, the New York Times just have headlines like Bolivian citizens rise up against Evo Morales. The Bolivian people, you know, speaking, you know, as one here. That's not what's going on at all. In Bolivia at the moment, you know, Bolivia at the time, 
there were protests in the upper class areas, or, you know, two or three of the big cities, but there were never any protests in uh, working class areas, in the rural areas. In fact, there were mobilizations in favor of the government, and they had the majority. And all of that voice was never, ever presented. And the one voice, one faction of the country, one right wing faction of the country, was presented as the only legitimate voice. And that's something I think has been done in Cuba. Uh, with that comes the whole narrative when there's mobilizations in favor of revolutionary processes, in favor of progressive governments. And line is, oh, well, they're all just paid. You know, they're all. Uh, paid to be there, or they've been coerced into being there. That's what they said, uh, you know, about Cuba when there was that giant march in Havana, which kind of marked the end of the whole uh, conflict, protest, period of protest a month ago. And, you know, all of that, they're saying, oh, these are, you know, they're, they're actors, they're paid, etc. And that's exactly what the people said about Bolivia at the time, where millions of indigenous people were mobilizing the length and breadth of the so, oh, they just, they don't even know what they're marching for, they're just paid to be there. And, you know, that was even said after the coup, after the mass lost power. When I would post, you know, videos or pictures of giant marches, people risking, you know, their, their lives to march against the dictatorship, he said, oh, they're all just being paid. Said, well, by who exactly? You know, it was a, it was like a broken record. It was their only reply. And so I think, We've got to try and dismantle some of that. We've got to point out how um, racist it is as well, because by delegitimizing mass mobilizations, uh, as there was in Cuba, in favor of the revolution, you're delegitimizing the voice of millions and millions of Cuban people. So those people might have a right to speak, and those people might have a right to be heard at an international level. And so, yeah, it was. That period when we were sharing footage on the ground in Cuba of, of these large pro-revolution marches, people were really pleased to see it because there's no one else doing it. None of the international media outlets are going to share that point of view, that you know, that point of view that millions of Cubans hold. So I think we should defend, you know, defend the voices of uh, the majority of Cuban people who were mobilised. In a, in a big way in favor of the revolution because if we don't do it no one else will so i think that's a so that's a comparison that was definitely there when we get to social media there's also a very strong comparison between what happened in bolivia in 2019 and the, the, the right-wing protests in cuba and that is a phenomenon of you know the troll farms the sprouting of thousands of bots accounts or the, you know, the phenomenon of having an account that has a name of Carlos and then eight numbers following it, and they created like two days ago, zero followers, but suddenly they're, you know, posting hundreds and hundreds of comments all across the internet about how, um, you know, I'm a Cuban, you know, we, we need help, etc. That's the same thing that happened in Bolivia. Bolivia, was a con Bolivia is still a country where people only really use Facebook, it's the only social media that use very few people use Twitter, Instagram and others. And the Q government realized that they had a weakness because a lot of journalists, people internationally often get you know some of the news and information. Okay, we, we may have lost Ollie for the for the moment, I will give him a few seconds to see if he comes back on. Can you hear us, Ollie? Okay, well, I think we may have to uh, leave it there with Ollie, who was talking. Oh, are you back, Ollie? Yeah. Okay, carry on. Very sorry about that. Shaky connection. <laughs> but yeah, there was the whole phenomenon of these accounts springing up around the hashtags, uh, sending sort of trolling and abuse to people uh, you know, who don't agree with the line of the US State Department. Just, you know, in, in my own personal experience, I remember at the time, just after the coup, I was just being flooded, endless abuse, just hundreds, hundreds of 
messages, comments every single day on, on my personal accounts. Um, yeah, it's insults, you know, it's childish insults or threats as well. Um, and then after the NES government collapsed, democracy was restored. The amount of abuse trolling that got reduced by about 90%. I've still got about 10% of people who, who like to still uh, send their insults my way. And I, I think they're organic, genuine accounts because very strange and obsessive. But the 90% of the generics, of abuse, uh, the trolling that we used to receive on my own accounts and on such news fell away after the government that tell us tells us that the funding dried up and we can see that going on in Cuba at the moment with hashtag SOS Cuba that's a template that's used in almost every country SOS, hashtag SOS that's the sort of CIA uh, classic I would say I mean is even the word SOS it implies not only implies it states very clearly you know, we we need someone outside to come in and rescue, help, intervene. You know, if you're ship stranded at sea, like, help, we need someone to come and help us, we, you know, to rescue us. And that's what the message is uh, of, the, of the information in Cuba. We want an external force to come in. And that's a, that whole demand for American intervention, for sanctions, it's just so alien to a genuine, Popular social movements, um, as there was in Bolivia, resisting. Throughout the whole time in Bolivia, we're fighting the streets, we're fighting for a return of democracy. Um, all throughout the whole year of persecution, of economic collapse, uh, you know, the move, people vigorously opposed the government. But throughout that time, no one ever called for sanctions against our own country, no one ever called for your friends. People are suffering enough. Why would we want our own people to suffer? You know, we will oppose the government in every way we can, but we're never going to uh, engage in an act of self harm, uh, or we wouldn't be very harmful and call for our fellow compatriots to suffer uh, sanctions, mass unemployment, things like this. It's never on the agenda, we've never discussed it. Never a demand of the social movements. So to see people in Cuba and Venezuela, many of them not even in the country, so they wouldn't even be there, you can suffer the consequences. To call for sanctions, to call for their own country to be laid at the siege because of their political differences with the government is something that people here wouldn't understand at all. Um, so that, that's a, there's a profound difference. Between genuine social movements that come out the grassroots faces out of genuine aspiration and needs of people versus Ashwich who are funded by the United States and the model they around the needs of their backers of the US State Department. So I think we should, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to compare and contrast to those two situations. There's, there's so many different things, and it, it helps to clarify uh, a lot of things. And yeah, I hope uh, I, I hope we can continue to, to do some reports on Cuba. We're based in Bolivia, but since the fall of the coup government in Bolivia, what we want to do is expand our work and be a voice for social movement, not just in Bolivia but across Latin America, and use the links we have in our work, different social movements. The links that Evo Morales is building here in Cochabamba with social movements, political leaders across the region, for this new phase of Latin American integration. That's what's going to be so important. Um, okay. Latin America coming together, cooperating, is the only solution out of, uh, of the crisis that Cuba is living in, to the crisis that the whole of Latin America is living in because of US intervention. Okay. Brilliant, Ollie. Well, well, thank you so much for the work you do uh, in Bolivia, but also sharing that information across the globe. I know your news channel is incredibly popular and it gives first hand information uh, from on the ground in Bolivia uh, to people around the world. And we've seen with the situation in Cuba uh, just how intense 
the international misrepresentation, uh, the misinformation campaign has been with those thousands of tweets, those thousands of uh, Facebook accounts. I mean, even The Guardian published a, a photo of uh, pro-Cuban uh, government uh, supporters and titled it uh, anti-government supporters uh, here. And those kind of uh, basic uh, attacks on Cuba were a real sort of uh, a, a, a dark spot, really, on international journalism at the time. And it's something that people like yourselves and ourselves need to work so hard uh, to counteract. So thank you so much. And there are links to all his uh, media channels, Catch One News, in the chat box as well. Our next speaker is, um, I'm very pleased she's able to join us uh, today. She's the Cuban um, ambassador here in London, uh, Barbara Montalvo Alvarez. And she's going to be able to give us a brief update on uh, the current situation in Cuba, the, the, the situation with COVID and the vaccine rollout, and also the international support that Cuba has been having over the past few weeks. So, Barbara, over to you. You're very welcome. Thank you, all of you, um, Rob. Um, I, I think that the, the, the Cuba Solidarity Campaign and the speakers join us today for the opportunity to address you this uh, evening. Uh, and I would like to, to thanks and express my, my highest appreciation to the panelists for their, their contributions. It is through that uh, um, unprecedented events occurred in Cuba, uh, but there was no uh, social explosion. Instead, a brutal ongoing media campaign uh, financed uh, by the US and Florida governments was instigated through lies on distortion, social unrest and violence to justify an intervention, I think the, um, the comments and the analysis of, of um, Christina was uh, very, very important to understand what happened. An unconventional war is being uh, wished against Cuba and in the form of uh, Cuba de Té, uh, leading the, uh, to a call of revolution. On July 11 was the latest uh, destabilization attempt Despite the efforts of, the of its sponsors, the repair of the constitutional order was not achieved on the island due to the people united with the wide consensus of the vast majority of Cubans prevented. The country remains calm and continuous efforts are made to control the second wave of the pandemic. Uh, you know, there is a complex situation. Uh, our authorities are evaluating the present situation in connection with representatives from different sectors in order to find the best solution to uh, all the problems. Developed countries uh, economically stronger than Cuba with more resources, and by the way, none of them uh, blocked by the USA, so their health system, their ICU was collapsed or in danger of collapse. And our authorities has been honest about the shortage of the food, medicine, raw materials and supplies and the significant limitation to export and receive foreign exchange to import and invest. And in the midst of, of these uh, restrictions, with the reserves that the country has created in a very, very hard conditions, with the little that we, we have been able to acquire uh, during this year and, and a half, all the challenges have been faced. The most recent uh, when more aggressive strains were detected and of course, I, I'm talking about the pandemic. More centers uh, had to be open, which means giving them energy priority and allocating more resources. As the number of patients increased, the stocks of medicines were depleted. The pandemic peak that we are facing has not been a problem for Cuba only as everyone knows. 
we bet that our prestigious biotechnology sector will achieve uh, its own vaccine against COVID-19. And we had uh, no alternative from my point of view. If we had not done, if we had done not it, today we would, we would be among those countries that have only managed to administer 1.5 doses per 100 people. And COVAX mechanism was not an alternative for Cuba, considering it would uh, have ensured only 20% uh, of the country's needs and due to its high cost. We don't have money to, to buy vaccines. So to produce our buy vaccines uh, uh, is the warranty to protect all the population. And the Cuban National Regulatory Agency approved the Abdala vaccine on July 19, making Cuba the first Latin American country to develop a successful COVID-19 vaccine. As you know, 92% effective after three doses. There are three other candidate vaccines in the works including Soberana 2, which is 91% effective when combined with a booster shot called Soberana Plus. All at this moment, uh, all the provinces of the country are conducting the vaccination program right now. Havana, the capital, and the special municipality of Isla de la Juventud have concluded as well as more than 40% of all the municipalities in just one month, one month since the authorization of the Abdallah. Meanwhile, risk groups uh, have, have been the number of one priority, including pregnant women in the first, second, and uh, third uh, trimesters, as well as of breastfeeding women and uh, of more than a thousand transplanted patients. Are you hearing me? Yeah? See. The Ismailillo clinical trial in children with Abdallah is on the way. It is a phase one and two study in the age between three and 18 years. In summary, more than 10.6 million doses have already been administered in the country with 24.5% of the population fully vaccinated according to unofficial data collected by the British SARS, our world in data, as of 6 August 2021. It's not Cuban SARS, it's a British SARS. Only 1.1% of people in long-income countries have received at least one dose. Uh, you know, some people do not, do not want to talk about the blockade say that is a pretext to cover up the incapacity and inefficiency of the system. But the blockade is the main obstacle to our development. And right now is the main cost of the situation we are facing in Cuba. But if it is a pretext, why is not lifted? And if it is true that it doesn't harm us, why it is implemented. In the USA, the most advanced capitalist economy in the world, 100% of Americans live in poverty, 22% live in substandard housing, 41% cannot afford health care. The U.S. administration should worry about solving their own problems. Millions of U.S. citizens need SOS. 
Curiously, the tightening of the measures and actions applied to asphyxiate Cuba, particularly during the pandemic, has taken place in the period when the Cuban model has undergone the most changes. For me, it's obvious that the goal is to prevent at all costs that this model proves efficient. They don't want that Cuba, the model of Cuba, uh, be successful. And that path can lead to a mistake. Uh, you know, we have a legitimate right to defend ourselves and we will. It would be uh, irresponsible to encourage, uh, to support in any way or remain silent about the possible use of force against Cuba. The US administration should decide the policy on Cuba based on the national interest of the USA and the mutual benefits of a normal relationship and not on electoral interest. As Fidel said, and I quote, sovereignty and freedom are essential rights of nations acknowledged by all the people of the world. And the more powerful a country is, the more it is obliged to respect small countries. It is not about defending only justice, which is our right. It is about defending the sovereignty of the country. It is about demonstrating that we have the right to govern ourselves and that no one has to draw the lines from outside. I, I finish, I reiterate on behalf of the Cuban people, our profound gratitude for the support and solidarity with our country offered throughout so many years. It has been especially uh, valued during the pandemic and in this particular moment. I, I would like to underline that many among you and, and beyond the, the United Kingdom who are part of the international movement of solidarity with Cuba, have united political or ideological preferences aside around a cause, a cause considered just against the blockade, against the interference in Cuba's affair, against any kind of intervention. It is not about defending a political system or model. Some may even be critical and not share our views, but still recognize and respect our sovereign rights. As this uh, afternoon, all of you uh, has expressed. I'm really, really thank you uh, for the support. Um, please confident that Cuba, the Cuban authorities, the people of Cuba uh, continue to do to the work to be more uh, uh, perfection, our model in order to uh, our people uh, receive the what which deserves, which is belief in peace and find the, the social benefits for all the people uh, by, by our efforts. But blockade is very, very hard. Thank you, thank you all of you. Well, well thank you, uh, Barbara. Uh, and uh, it's an honor that you're with us today, but I know you speak uh, as an ambassador for your country and uh, uh, we know uh, the difficulties that, that your people are facing, but we also know the strength uh, of people like yourself and the Cuban people at times like this. It's been a 60 year uh, yeah. struggle uh, with the world's biggest superpower 
uh, just a few miles away, doing everything it can to impose its will uh, upon your country. And it's, uh, it's a, a real um, example of your strength um, to stand firm in those circumstances, which I think gives strength to people across the globe in Bolivia, in Nicaragua, in Venezuela, to see your resistance. We know it's difficult, but we stand shoulder to shoulder with you today and tomorrow. So thank you for joining us uh, uh, tonight. Um, our next speaker, uh, our final speaker of the evening, we're, is uh, someone I'm very uh, pleased to call a friend and somebody who we worked with uh, for many, many years, um, who's done a lot of work over so many years with Cuba and continues to do so. Now he's a, a leading uh, member of parliament. So Richard Bergen is the MP for Leeds East. Um, he's also the secretary of the Socialist uh, Campaign Group of Labour MP. So Richard Bergen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks so much, Rob, and thanks, uh, Ambassador, and thanks to all the speakers. It's a real pleasure to be with uh, so many people this evening, uh, united around the uh, common cause of supporting the self-determination of the Cuban people and opposing uh, the brutal uh, blockade that's caused so much suffering and misery to the Cuban people over so many decades. And we're meeting, of course, at a time where the current situation in Cuba as Graham Morris, my friend and colleague, mentioned earlier, is causing real suffering for the Cuban people with serious shortages of food, medicine and power supplies. Anybody who cares about the Cuban people, anybody who is a humanitarian, will be sorry to hear this, will be sorry to know this. But unfortunately, uh, right-wing and politically extreme elements in the United States are amongst those actually who are rejoicing in this misery because they see it as an opportunity to push uh, the leadership of the United States of America uh, to take uh, a more hardline position uh, in relation to Cuba. And we can't uh, discuss the situation uh, in Cuba uh, and the suffering that's going on without reference to the blockade. And I know that some people would rather we didn't talk about that, but it's, in, it's vital that we do and let's start off talking about the blockade by looking at how the United States saw the blockade when it introduced it. I think this is very important. So the 1960 memorandum from the United States State Department on the blockade of Cuba sets out their position as follows and I quote, the only foreseeable means of alienating internal support that's the Cuban government, is through disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. Every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba, a line of action which, while as adroit and inconspicuous as possible, makes the greatest inroads in denying money and supplies to Cuba, to decrease monetary and real wages, to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of the government. So this blockade, condemned repeatedly by the international community, has as its stated purpose, bringing about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of government. Not my words, the words of the memorandum uh, from the United States State Department when they introduced uh, the blockade uh, some six decades ago. And leaders uh, in uh, the region of Latin America, of course, understand this. For example, in 2009, the then president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, said, it is impossible to judge the success or failure of the Cuban model without considering the blockade, a blockade that has lasted for 50 years. Ecuador would not survive for five months with that blockade. That comment was made uh, more than a decade ago. So Cuba has now had to endure this blockade uh, for 60 years. And let's be clear about the position today. Today, the blockade is preventing Cuba from accessing hard currency to buy medicines and has barred delivery of medical aid for COVID. So the US policy of the blockade is directly causing deaths. Now, my colleague Graham Morris mentioned earlier uh, a recent uh, or fairly recent early day motion uh, in the parliament uh, here in Britain uh, which he tabled on the 25th of February. Um, it was a motion against the blockade 
uh, of Cuba, and it was signed by 58 uh, members uh, of our parliament. Uh, and of course, uh, the United Nations has yet again uh, recently voted against the blockade uh, of Cuba. Um, and United, the United States government and the government of Israel, the only two governments uh, supporting the blockade uh, of Cuba. So the, really the position that we're putting forward to end the blockade of Cuba, it's the mainstream position, the position uh, taken uh, by governments, the majority of governments uh, around the world. On July the 16th, the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs uh, issued a statement about the situation uh, in Cuba, and it was signed by 30 parliamentarians. I'll just read through it because I think it's useful uh, to share exactly what our group of uh, Labour members of parliament said about the situation. Uh, it said, and this is on uh, July the 16th, the current situation in Cuba is causing real suffering for the Cuban people with serious shortages of food, medicine and power supplies. This emergency is a result of the ongoing US blockade, the additional 243 sanctions imposed by the Trump administration and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Any calls for foreign intervention in Cuba for so-called humanitarian reasons are dangerous and disingenuous. The quickest and easiest intervention would be for the US to lift its unilaterally imposed and inhumane near 60 year blockade. We welcome the UK's vote in June at the United Nations where 184 countries voted for an end to the blockade with just two countries opposed. We call on President Biden to make good on his campaign promises and immediately suspend the US sanctions to allow the Cuban people themselves to overcome the current difficulties. As I say, that was signed by uh, 30 parliamentarians. And I referenced, uh, we referenced in that uh, statement, the fact that the UK government was one of the uh, countries at the United Nations that voted against the continuing blockade of Cuba, which just goes to show, as the ambassador said, this isn't about uh, requiring every country uh, or every government or every political party to approve or disapprove of the Cuban model, to advocate uh, or argue against it. This is about the principle of self-determination and sovereignty and the humanitarian principle that the blockade should not be allowed to continue. Uh, it's causing real suffering, which is no surprise because that's its very purpose. The internationalism of the Cuban people has been an inspiration to people the world over. And now at this critical point, it's a duty of everyone around the world to return that solidarity, to return that internationalism. Uh, Nelson Mandela said that from its earliest days, these are his words, from its earliest days, the Cuban revolution has also been a source of inspiration to all freedom loving people. We admire the sacrifices of the Cuban people in maintaining their independence and sovereignty in the face of the vicious imperialist orchestrated campaign to destroy the impressive gains made in the Cuban revolution. And that was N Nelson Mandela uh, not long after uh, the collapse of apartheid. And of course, Cuba as an internationalist country played a key, key role uh, in assisting the end of the vicious apartheid uh, system uh, in South Africa. The Cuban internationalist involvement in Angola uh, was pivotal to the collapse uh, of um, apartheid in South Africa. And Nelson Mandela talked about how the Cuban involvement in Angola uh, ended the myth uh, of uh, white supremacy. Uh, and I think it's an important point that he made there. Also, all around the world, the internationalism of Cuba has manifested itself in its medical interventions, whether that be um, the uh, medical interventions restoring the sight to so many people uh, around the world with eye operations, Operation Miracle, uh, whether it be the Henry Reeve Brigade going to some of the most inaccessible and dangerous places on earth to save lives and increase the quality of living, or whether it be the Latin American School of Medicine in Havana, which has trained up so many uh, people from underprivileged and ordinary backgrounds uh, around the world uh, to become uh, doctors. So that's the internationalism uh, of the Cuban uh, revolution. And we owe a duty, not just as humanitarians ourselves, but as internationalists to speak up for Cuba uh, when people 
and making outrageous uh, calls uh, against Cuba. And when people are trying to increase uh, the misery of the Cuban uh, people in relation to the shortages I've just referred to, and are trying to use that for their own political, ideological ends. For example, as was referenced earlier, the mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez, actually called for military action, for military intervention in Cuba. And he gave as an example of how he thinks it could work the 1989 invasion of Panama, an invasion which left more than 2,000 people dead. So those are the kind of extreme calls that we've been seeing uh, in this uh, situation uh, from right-wing politicians uh, in the United States, who, as the ambassador said, would be better turning their attentions to the issues in their own country uh, rather than making such blood-curdling extreme calls. So the calls from Florida and from the United States for a so-called humanitarian corridor have military intervention and regime change as the ultimate goal. They're disingenuous, they're dangerous, because they're coming from the same people who have supported the blockade and called for it to be tightened over the years. If these politicians, if these people uh, cared about the welfare of the Cuban people, they would be calling for the lifting of the blockade. Uh, rather than, as some of them have done, called for the tightening of the blockade. Because the blockade uh, is part of a set of policies responsible for the humanitarian crisis that the island now faces. Because the US blockade is now as severe as it has been at any time in the 60-year history of that uh, blockade. The US intervention has caused thousands of deaths in the last 60 years, from um, the Bay of Pigs to mercenary attacks on the island, Bombing campaigns uh, in Cuban hotels uh, in the 1990s in an attempt to scare tourists from going to Cuba, in an attempt to strangle the emergent tourist industry uh, in Cuba at the time, which was helping uh, to support the Cuban economy, particularly uh, after the collapse uh, of the, uh, the Soviet Union. Of course, the numerous ass assassination attempts on the Cuban leaders and actual attacks against Cuban diplomats uh, abroad. So this is the context that this needs to be uh, seen in and, and that the people making these calls need to be uh, from the United States need to be uh, see, uh, seen in. Now, funding increased uh, under Trump uh, for the funding of groups, many covert, advocating regime change in Cuba to the tune of $20 million a year, money that actually they could spend on genuine humanitarian aid, such as the syringes that we've heard that the island needs to complete uh, its vaccination uh, program. And in the last week, um, President Biden has introduced new sanctions against Cuba. Uh, we referenced in our uh, statement from the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, the promises he made in, an, in his election. Rather than introducing new sanctions against Cuba, President Biden should honour those election uh, promises. And by introducing those new sanctions, President Biden is ignoring the international community vote at the United Nations. So we ask President Biden uh, to uh, think again. But at the same time, as we've heard uh, from the ambassador and from other speakers, other countries are setting the example on a genuine humanitarian response. For example, Mexico sent 800,000 syringes, two shipments of food and medical aid. Vietnam, Russia, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Venezuela have all sent aid in the last two weeks as well. And the president of Mexico said on the 12th of July, the truth is that if one wanted to help Cuba, the first thing that should be done is to suspend the blockade of Cuba as a majority of countries in the world are asking. So now is the time now is the time to increase solidarity with Cuba, not reduce solidarity with Cuba. Now is not the time to uh, remain silent. And we heard earlier about the distorted way the situation in Cuba has been reported around the world. How many news reports mention the blockade and mention the purpose of the blockade and the reality of the blockade and its effects on the lives of people in Cuba? far too few. We've seen as well in the reports where Cuban people demonstrating in support uh, of the Cuban government and in support uh, of their right for self-determination and sovereignty and against the blockade have been pictured in newspapers and online as if they were 
demonstrating against uh, the uh, the Cuban government. You know, most famously, for example, uh, we saw a, a photo showing uh, a demonstration in which the 26th of July movement flag was being flown, uh, which is, of course, a movement started by Fidel Castro uh, uh, in the early uh, 1950s. And that appeared in our newspapers uh, as an example of a demonstration against the Cuban government. So all is not uh, as it has been presented uh, in too much uh, of uh, the media. Jose Marti uh, said, and this is one of my favourite quotes from him, that humanity is our homeland. For the sake of humanity, whether you're on the left, as I am, and a socialist, or whether you're not uh, on the, the left and you have a different political framework, your political framework is almost irrelevant for this purpose. What matters is do you care about the Cuban people? And if you care about the Cuban people, if you care uh, about their standard of living, if you care about the principle of sovereignty and self-determination, then you need to raise your voices in opposition to the blockade of Cuba. And when you do so, you'll be doing so uh, as part of the mainstream, as part of the majority of governments in the world, 184 countries just the other month, again, voting against this blockade at uh, the United Nations. So I'm delighted that the Cuba Solidarity Campaign is continuing to let the truth be known about Cuba, to amplify Cuban voices and to campaign on the blockade and campaign for the ending of the blockade and for sanctions uh, on Cuba. I think more and more people in our country and around the world are seeing how ludicrous and inhumane the blockade is. So many people from my own constituency and from constituencies across our country have been to Cuba on holiday uh, in recent decades. And when they learn, uh, or when they learnt that Cuba had been placed upon um, a list of countries supposedly supporting terrorism, what a false insult against Cuba. When they learn about the uh, decades old blockade of Cuba, they ask themselves why, because all these things are doing and making the people of Cuba suffer. So now is the time to show in practice that humanity is our homeland and increase our calls to end the blockade of Cuba and increase our calls for the Cuban people to be allowed to decide their own destiny by the principles of self-determination of sovereignty being respected, including by the United States of America. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Richard, uh, for those powerful words. It's uh, always great to hear you speak. Thank you so much. Um, as ever with these meetings, we've, we've seriously gone over time, so we're, we're not going to have uh, very much time, but I'm being pressed to answer a couple of questions for people uh, and give the, speak, the panellists a, a very brief opportunity. So prepare yourself one minute answers if you want to come back at all, uh, panellists. Don't feel you have to. But before we come back to the panellists for that one minute final uh, comment, if they want to, I'd like to thank people, over 300 people with us uh, tonight, people from across the globe, from Canada, Cyprus, Indonesia, the USA, Ireland, Pakistan, Mexico, Barbados, South Africa, Australia, and from all over. So thank you all uh, for joining us tonight. If you uh, are not a member of the campaign, please join. If you want to donate uh, to the COVID appeal, please do so. If you just want to help the campaign and donate, you can do. And all the links are there in the chat. You can sign up for our newsletters, but do whatever to help the solidarity movement, uh, share uh, details about events and activities and about the Cuba Solidarity Campaign and above all uh, learn about Cuba, learn the reality of Cuba and find out what is really going on which uh, is the purpose of tonight's uh, meeting. There was one specific question for Graham Morris uh, who was from uh, Mary Lynham which was uh, to him directly thanks for mentioning the MS Bremer um, and Cuba's response to Covid in the world and she asks about working towards a single uh, Cuba solidarity campaign throughout Europe, uh, which would bring friends of Cuba and trade unions particularly all together. So Graham might want to mention that one in his speech. There were also, in his last minute uh, uh, presentation, there were also questions about the success of the left uh, in Latin America and how that uh, might help Cuba. There was a specific one about uh, Cuba's uh, brilliant results at the Olympics. Um, there was also, a question which comes up every time 
um, in these meetings. Why is it that if 180, 184 countries this year vote against the blockade and only the United States and Israel vote, against, uh, vote for it to carry on, why does it continue? Why does the UN allow the blockade to continue when the will of the world is so against the blockade? So there's just a few of the questions. We've, we've got 20 or 30 different questions in chat and I hope that we'll be able to answer all of them uh, to those people over the next few days, uh, either in chat or directly to the participants. So thank you all for coming. Just briefly now, if uh, Graham wants to kick off with a few words, but remember it's just a minute each if you want to contribute, but uh, don't feel you have to, Graham. Okay, thanks very much, Rob. J just quickly, I did try and, and respond to uh, to, uh, to Murray Lynham. I, I don't know if I was successful with the technology, but uh, you know, I, I completely agree with, uh, with her commentary there that, it, it did show considerable generosity of spirit for the Cuban authorities to uh, allow the uh, British uh, cruise ship, the MS Braemar, to uh, have safe docking and to provide medical support to the crew and the staff. And that is in contrast with what the United States have, have done in denying medical supplies, components, and even access, access to hard currency to allow those vital supplies to be bought. So, so, so yes, I think if we're talking about moral superiority, that then Cuba wins hands down, not just in the uh, Olympic boxing, but on the, uh, on the moral scale of, in these judgments. I, I, um, I, I, I mean, it's appalling and, and the numbers are, are, are clear. I mean, we've kept the pressure on the British government in relation to normalizing relations with Cuba and for them to put pressure on the US administration. In response to the particular question, would it be beneficial for us to work together? I'm kind of, I, I'm in your hands on this, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, I'm looking at the ambassador as to where, as to how that could be done. Uh, I, I'm quite happy to work with, uh, uh, you know, progressive elements of like mind uh, in order to try and secure a, a lifting of the sanctions and the blockade. If that would be more effective, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to uh, engage in that. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll be guided by your uh, expertise uh, in the diplomatic field. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks, Graham. Um, just, do, do other people want to say anything? Ollie, did you want to say anything? Are you OK? Um, yeah, yeah, just, uh, just a comment on the question about the left in Latin America. I think it's incredibly important. We've seen uh, Mexico, Bolivia, Nicaragua send you know, aid to Cuba this past week. And just a couple of days ago, Peru announced that they're formally leaving the Lima Group, which is that alliance of right-wing governments with the US and Canada. The whole aim was to isolate Venezuela and kind of enforce the blockade on Venezuela, which is very similar to what the blockade that's been imposed on Cuba. And the fact that almost half of the original members have now left because they've left the Mexican government weakens those attempts to enforce blockade so you know the the blockade re requires a complicity of right-wing governments in the region so if those can be flipped by democratic forces within those countries that gives a fighting chance a real fighting chance to cuba to venezuela and other countries that are under attack and that's why i think we need you know uh, such a news at least we always try to talk about American in an integrated way. <coughs> no, uh, no country works as an island, especially within that region. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you. Um, Barbara, would you like to say uh, some final words? Or are you okay? Uh -oh. I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Are you sure that we, we work blockade or not blockade? We need to, to work better and to improve uh, our our model and the olympics ah fine we are happy very happy you know cuban people is emotional people so we we are very 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 happy yeah uh, for people who don't know uh, cuba came uh, 14th <laughs> in the league table of all the countries of the world so a very small country uh, punching wow. very much above its weight so congratulations on that so the thank final you, word thank you uh, very much Richard, if you wanted to say uh, a final word I just wanted to uh, thank uh, you, Rob, and all the panellists, particularly uh, the ambassador. Thanks so much for this fantastic event tonight, for the ongoing work of the 
uh, CSC. And I'd like, uh, along with Graham, to encourage all the people who are part of our political family, myself and Graham's political family, uh, the Labour Party and the Labour left, to join the Cuba Solidarity Campaign. If you're an internationalist, uh, if you uh, believe that the Cuban people should be able to determine their own future, free from uh, the interference of the United States uh, of America, if you think the blockade should end, if you admire the medical internationalism of the uh, Cuban revolution, then I'd ask you to join uh, the Cuba Solidarity Campaign uh, tonight, because by doing so, that in itself is an act of solidarity and a practical act of support for the Cuban people. It's a very difficult time. Well, on, on those words, I think it's a wonderful way to, to end the meeting. So thank uh, you again, Richard, uh, for your support. For Graham Morris MP, thank you again for joining us. To the Ambassador, Barbara Montalvo uh, as well, and Oli Vargas from Bolivia, and also, of course, to Len McCluskey and uh, Christina Escobar. But above all, thank all of you for attending uh, tonight's meeting. I apologise we've gone over uh, the length, but obviously there's a lot to talk about. But thank you so much for attending and uh, we'll see you again uh, soon, I'm sure. Thank you all very much.